and uh, and uh, you know uh, people are going to get desperate for God. Yes, that's right. So we need to be ready for them. Are you ready? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, I was just thinking about uh, you know Palm Sunday and 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 the Passion Week, and of course next uh, Friday is uh, is Good Friday where we commemorate and remember and uh, actually celebrate the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus because what looked like a bad thing and what appeared to be a, a, a defeat was actually a victory. God's plan came together on Good Friday and God's plan of redemption was accomplished on Good Friday. That's why we call it Good Friday and not Evil Friday. Amen. Amen. And I know that, you know, the Romans and the Jews, they get a lot of grief over uh, uh, crucifying Jesus. And they did, you know, they did put him up there. They did whip him and beat him and put him up there. But that was all in God's plan. Yes. That was God's determination. And uh, God uh, and uh, God allowed it to happen. And, and uh, Jesus did not prevent it and, or stop it. He could have. You know, the old song says he could have called 10,000 angels to come and rescue him from the cross. But he did not because he saw ahead and saw the benefit of him dying and so he gave up his life they didn't take it he gave it up yeah. for us and i want to talk about that in in uh, in some respects this morning and i want you to turn with me first of all to philippians chapter 2 and we're going to look at the word of god concerning what jesus did for us i know this is going to be repeat for everybody in this room there are no novices here. Everybody here has had uh, uh, a lifetime of hearing about Jesus, hearing about the cross. But I think it's good. The Bible says that 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 uh, we need to stir up people's memories. I think it's beneficial for us to stir up our memories and revisit truth. Yes. Amen. So that we cannot let it slip from us. Because I see a lot of falling away from the gospel in the church today, in, in, in America, in the world. There are people that are going after all kinds of strange doctrines and always trying to come up with a new one, trying to invent something new that no one else has ever heard, when the old story is the best story. And I agree with the song, tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Keeping the main thing the main thing. And last week I talked about how we need to be rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus. He is our source of life. If, we're taking a, uh, if we take a detour and we get separated from him, we die. And religious people are just as bad. Churches die. I'm talking about, you know, there, there are some churches that may be full of people today, but they're deader than a doorknob. Why? Because they are, they they've gone off into other things, and they've they've strayed away from the simplicity of the gospel. I listened to uh, uh, several messages uh, of Reinhard Bonnke. You know, Reinhard Bonnke uh, at one time was the premier uh, world evangelist. He would have he's probably had on record the biggest crowds of any crusade in uh, in in history. There, there were several crusades he had in Africa where he had over a million people in one service. He had hundreds of thousands of people walk the aisles and get saved in one service. That uh, Just a remarkable, remarkable ministry. And so I, I tuned in to listen to some of his messages that he was preaching in those crusades. And I was blown over by the utter simplicity of what he was doing preaching to those people that have a people million million people in the audience and what well, you know what he's preaching he's preaching jesus christ and him crucified and risen again he's preaching the easter message and then he gives an altar call and thousands upon tens of thousands of people responding and and come to jesus uh, and because of the anointing that is on this message this is the message Sometimes we get caught up, cut, you know, caught up in teaching on other things, and other things are important. You know, we need to we need to go into the deeper things. You know, Paul said it in Hebrews. He said he said leaving the principal doctrines 
of Christ or the foundations of, of the doctrines of Christ. Let's go on to deeper things. And there is a place for learning deeper things. But the simple message of Jesus coming and dying for us and being raised from the dead, is, is the, that's the power of the gospel right there. And, and we don't need to forget it. We need to remember it for ourselves. We need to be sure and pass it on to generations after us. And, uh, and we need to be able to articulate the message out of our own mouth. If you can preach what I'm going to preach this morning, then you can go out there and be a Reinhard Bonnke. I remember uh, my, my good friend and mentor and father figure, uh, Don Norman. Uh, he had grew up in Africa and was a great evangelist in Africa and uh, won many, many, many people to the Lord in his country. He and his wife became a mission, missionaries uh, to uh, uh, Zambia, actually, and, uh, and, you know, for many years. And he built churches all over South Africa and uh, pastored the largest church in uh, Rhodesia for many years and just, you know, finally had to come to the United States as a, as a refugee because they were going to kill him. And, uh, and he and his wife came to this country and we got to know them very well and, and fellowship with them and, uh, and just a tremendous blessing in my life. But he told me, he said, when he first began to preach, nobody would let him preach because he didn't have any Bible school. He didn't have any, you know, he was an engineer. And, uh, and so he would preach on the street corners. He would walk up to people on the street and preach to them. And he said, I, I only had one thing. He said, I had John 3.16 in my testimony. And he said, I think I led more people to Jesus with John 3.16 in my testimony than I ever have being a, being a fancy preacher. There you go. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. There you go. How many of you know John 3.16? And you have a testimony. You got what it takes to win multitudes to Jesus. He said. He said. I. He said. I would get up in the in and I would give my text and I would I would I would preach a big mess of a sermon. And he said my my sermon had nothing to do with my text. My and and, and a lot of times I was absolutely wrong in my theology. But he said he said I, at the end I'd give my testimony. And I'd, and I'd give an altar call and, he, and, and 100 people would come and give their life to the Lord. God anoints our testimony and he anoints John 3.16. <laughs> so keep it simple when you're talking to people. Amen. We don't have to answer all their questions. One of the best things you can tell somebody when they start asking questions is, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But here's what I do know. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son for you that you would be able to go to heaven. Just believe on him. Let me tell you what happened to me. There you go. John 3, 16 in your testimony. And you can reel them in. Amen. Say, that's good preaching, Pastor. All right, now let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's talking about Jesus' mental attitude. There was, there was something in Jesus that led him to do what he did. And let's, let's read about it here. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Okay, here's, here's something we know about Jesus. He, he was in the form of God. He was God. And he didn't think it robbery to be equal with God. Okay. He, he, was, he was God. Jesus was God. In him, you know, we live and move and have our being, right? Yes. John chapter 1 says, In the, in the beginning there was, there was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the Father. Amen. So Jesus was in the beginning with God. He was God. He was equal to God. But, verse 7, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant 
and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus started out in heaven, started out in glory. He, bega he was one of those without beginning. He was the word of God. He was God. He was with God from the very beginning. And, and 1 John uh, John chapter 1 also says that everything that was made was made by Him. He was the Creator God. Jesus is the Word that came out of God's mouth. When God said something, that was Jesus that came out of His mouth. He was that Word. He was that seed. He was that life. And, and, uh, and yet, He laid all of that aside and humbled Himself and took upon Himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. See, we have no way of understanding what that meant. We have no way of understanding how far he came from being the Lord of glory to being a baby in a manger in human form. There's a song that we used to sing a lot, Down From His Glory. Jesus really came down. He took a giant leap downward when he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of uh, a fallen man, even though he wasn't fallen. He took upon himself our form. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But he, that was the plan, right? God so loved the world that he gave up his only son to die on the cross. Jesus came down from heaven, down from glory, down from being the creator word of God, took upon himself the form of man in order to die for man. That's the gospel. We have no idea how humbling that was for Jesus. Because in heaven, they, 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 they worshiped him. The angels, you know, we talked about that. The angels just swirl around the throne saying, holy, 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 right? That, that was, that was uh, what he was receiving as, as, as God in heaven. But he gave up all of that pomp, all of that luxury, all of that power, all of that being, uh, being, being who he was. He gave up his reputation and came to the earth where no one knew it. And where they eventually despised him and hated him and crucified him. That's humility. Amen. And he did it for us. And now look at verse 9 though. I, like, I don't like stopping before the end of the story. I don't like these movies they have on TV where they always stop at the crucifixion. Man, if they don't go all the way, if they don't go all the way to the resurrection, I get upset. Depends a lot on who makes the movie, doesn't it? Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He came down from glory. He suffered our humiliation, our disgrace, our shame, our sin, our death, our sickness, our disease, our defeat, paid the penalty for us. And then God raised him from the dead and he highly exalted him above all powers and principalities and gave him a name that's above every name. And at his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is the Lord to the glory of the Father. So he left glory, suffered our shame, and then returned to glory. Amen. Jesus is not on the cross either. I don't, I don't like these, these, uh, these depictions of Jesus still on the cross. That's right. Yeah, that's good. That's right. Amen. 
I went into a church, uh, I won't tell you which denomination it was, but I went into a church in Mexico one day, you know, a beautiful church, beautiful ornate, I mean, wonderful, right in the middle of a village. And I went inside and as I'm walking through the vestibule, I noticed there was a casket right there in the vestibule in this, in this beautifully ornate, hand carved little kind of a grotto right in the middle, right there in the foyer. And, and there was this casket and the casket was open. I thought I had interrupted somebody's funeral. And I looked in the casket and there was, there was this, this, this figure of Jesus Christ laying in the casket. And I thought, haven't they heard? Don't, don't they know he's not dead? And he never was in a casket. I was dumbfounded. But then I went on into the chapel and there was this big cross above the altar and guess who was on the cross? Still. They, they, I mean, they, they, really, they really bore down on his suffering. I mean, there were, uh, there were these uh, stained glass windows all the way around that were the 12 stations of the cross. And they showed, you know, they showed everything. And they showed all, all these depictions of his suffering, but there was not a mention in their architecture or in their decorations or in anything they did. There was no mention of his resurrection. I want to tell you, the story is not complete until you have Jesus on the throne at the right hand of God as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. It's an unfinished story and we need to be sure it's finished in people's uh, understanding of what happened. But Jesus, Jesus came for a purpose and this scripture, what this scripture reveals is he accomplished his purpose. He finished it and now he's been restored to glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, Turn with me to Isaiah 53. Now, th this is real familiar. I'm, I'm reading familiar stuff. Man, it, it's, like, it's like we're eating Thanksgiving dinner. We're eating familiar food. Turkey and dressing. Cranberries. Mashed potatoes and gravy. My mouth is watering. Hallelujah. Buttered rolls. Glory to God. Banana pudding. Coconut cream pie. German chocolate cake. Who familiar foods. You know why familiar foods are so familiar? It's because they're our favorites. We eat them a lot. This is a familiar story, isn't it? What I'm sharing with you this morning is nothing new. And yet there are millions, I would say billions of people on the earth have never heard it. They've never heard it. Listen, there are people in Jacksonville, Florida that have never heard what I'm talking about. That's right. Amen. Isaiah 53, look at verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's see how many hours are in here. Surely he hath borne our griefs, our sorrows, our transgressions, our iniquities, our peace, and it's implied, our stripes, that's six, and, and our iniquities, that's seven. Seven times in these verses, he, he refers to Jesus taking our place or bearing what belongs to us. Our sorrows, our griefs, our iniquities, our peace. Amen? So, let me ask you this. Why did Jesus come and why, who did he do all this for? He did it for us. 
you would be you would be in order and certainly justified to write down, right above the, that word our your own name. Yeah, that's right. that's good. Jesus has borne my griefs. He has carried my sorrows. Amen. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And with his stripes, I am healed. Amen. Because the Lord has laid on him my iniquity. He did it for me. He did it for you. He did it for all mankind. Amen. And he said, whosoever will may come and take freely of the water of life that I give. He said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why? Because he did it for us. Everything Jesus suffered, and you're going to, yeah, you're you're going to see it portrayed. You're going, you know, if you watch, uh, you know, some of the movies about the crucifixion that they love to show this during this week. If you watch these things, if you watch, you know, uh, any depiction of it, you're going to you're going to see only the tip of the iceberg of what he actually felt and experienced. There's no way we can understand how, what he felt and experienced. We, you know, it's it's like it's like watching a movie. You don't you don't feel the heat. You don't smell the smells. You don't you don't feel the pain, the anguish. But when you watch these things, you need to always remember, he did it for me. I like the Mel Gibson version of the Passion of the Christ. Um, I say I like it. You know, it's it's hard to watch. And one scene that just tears me up, and that's when he's at the whipping post, yes. and when they're beating him, and uh, and turning him in, into a, a just a mangled, bloody, unrecognizable uh, uh, mess, and his blood's running down, and then later, you know, Mary comes out with a towel after they take him away. She comes out and gets on her hands and knees and tries to wipe up the blood, and it's it's just impossible. And I'm looking at that, and I'm watching that, and I'm I'm thinking, he did that for me. Amen. And it's by those stripes that I am healed. And then I feel shame. I feel guilt. I, I, I feel I feel ashamed that I have any sicknesses, that I have anything in me that's not well. That's good. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You know, you, you might look at your, your, your little pill bottle and, and, and think of all the different pills you take for the different ailments you have. And, and, and when, you, when you look at that in comparison to what Jesus suffered, you feel, you really feel ashamed. Amen. <laughs> it's because by those stripes, we are healed. Not, we could be, but... We are. And we need, oh, we need to realize, we need to take it personal, people. Just like we take it personal for our own souls saved, our own forgiveness, we need to take it personal for our own healing because He bore our sicknesses. He bore our diseases. He took upon Himself all of our anguishes, even our sorrows. And it's hard not to sorrow. You know, when people pass, when when they pass out of our life, we and we become separated from them because of death. But the Bible says, as believers, we don't sorrow like the unbelievers do, because we have this. Not only do we have hope that we're going to see them again and we're going to be reunited again, but we have someone who bore our griefs and our sorrows. He bore it. Amen. Amen. One part of us grieves and, and one part of us is sorrowful. And you know what part of us that is? That's the selfish part. But the part that really loves those people rejoices that they are in the presence of God and that they're no longer suffering. Amen. We so we're kind of a we're kind of a contradiction. 
We sorrow joyfully. And I'll never forget my dad's funeral. And uh, my friend Ricky Fowl, I asked him if he would, if he would uh, deliver the eulogy at my dad's funeral. And uh, before the service, he came up to me and he says, well, how do you want it to go? And I said, if we're not laughing before you're finished, we're going to be disappointed. Because my dad loved to laugh. He loved to tease. He loved, he loved pranks. And he loved to laugh. And I said, I, I said, you know, we're not honoring him if we leave here sorrowful. If we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna honor my dad, we're gonna have to leave here laughing. And so he, knowing my dad, you know, he, he, uh, you know, he grew up and married into my family. He married my cousin, and uh, and he knew my dad. He knew his brothers, and my my uncles, and and so he had some story. He had some good stories, and he's telling stories. And we're laughing. Well, I had invited some of my Church of Christ friends to come. And, uh, well, I didn't invite them, but, you know, I was, do I was doing business with them. And so uh, uh, they came. They came to honor me. And, you know, there's about uh, eight of them. And, and uh, they got upset. They said we were irreverent. And I mean, when I saw them later, I, I was thanking them for coming, and they said, wow, in the world, that's the worst funeral we ever went to. I said, what are you talking about? Well, everybody was just laughing and cutting up. That guy's up there telling jokes. Hallelujah. And I said, well, I asked him to. Well, why would you want to do something like that at your own dad's funeral? And I said, because that's my dad. Yeah, <laughs> it was a joyful occasion. Well, weren't, weren't you sorrowful? Yeah, but we were sorrowful in a joyful way. Well, they, they could not even comprehend what I was talking about. You know why? You know why that is? Because righteousness, peace, and joy are in the Holy Ghost. And they didn't have the Holy Ghost. So they had no, they had no joy. They had, they had absolutely no joy. And they couldn't understand us folks laughing at a funeral. But if you're so blessed and so fortunate as to be around when I when I pass on, I hope you can laugh at my funeral because I've asked Ricky Fowle to give the eulogy. You know, and he'll probably be around. You know. So anyway, praise the Lord. Everybody say praise the Lord. <laughs> Look in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 says, After this manner pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. His death was not about himself or even his coming into his kingdom. Because remember, he was in glory to start with. Jesus did not need a kingdom. He didn't come so he could enter into his kingdom. He came so he could bring us into his kingdom. Listen, folks. I don't care what you think about Jesus. It was not about Jesus. It was about us. Amen. He didn't come to. He resisted every attempt to establish a kingdom on this world. He said, my kingdom is in the hearts of men. He came to bring us into his kingdom. Amen. His whole purpose. Look in 1 Peter 2.21. He says, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us. I want to underline that. Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Wait a minute. He suffered for us, and we're supposed to follow in his steps, which means we're supposed to suffer. For somebody. 
See, he's called us into, into a life of, of laying down our lives for others, just like he laid down his life for us. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It's there, folks. You can't, you, can't, you can't ignore it. It's there. It's all through, it's all through, through the New Testament. Yeah. Take up your cross and follow me. Right. Amen. The works that I do, you shall do also. We think of the miracles. We think of all the, uh, um, you know, you know, wonderful healings and deliverances and things like that when we think about doing the works of Jesus. But one of the works of Jesus was to pick up a cross. And it wasn't his. It was someone else's cross. And suffer someone else's punishment. And then he tells us, take up your cross and follow me. So our life, our life is about following Jesus into the path that he's walked in. We don't have to die on the cross like he did, but there is a cross for us. There is a price. He said, they hate me, they're going to hate you. They persecute me, they're going to persecute you. Right? That's the cross. We pick up that cross and we identify with Jesus and then we lay down our lives for other people. We don't live just for me. I think, I think a lot more of us would be wealthy if God knew that we would use our wealth to spread the gospel and to bless other people. But if God thinks that you're going to just spend it all on yourself, why waste it on you? Amen? Any, anything that is spent on me Anything that, that, that I get just for me is a waste. Only those things I do for others matters. Amen. Amen. Take up a cross and follow him. He said he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Amen. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. The purpose of everything Jesus went through on the tree, on the cross, was to bring us back into God's family and back to our shepherd and bishop of our soul to restore us to God. He didn't do it for himself. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus didn't do it for himself. Amen. He did it for you. He did it for me. Look in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Why was Jesus brought here for the suffering of death? He didn't come here to start a new organization. He didn't come here to seek and gain the worship of men. He came here to die. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. That's his creative. He's the creator. It became him in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Now, you know what this scripture is saying? This scripture is saying he left glory and came to earth to die for us. So that he could take us into glory. He came down from glory to bring us up to glory. That was his purpose. His purpose wasn't just to save us and leave us. 
His purpose was to save us and take us to glory. And we, it begins in this life because, because uh, you know, Colossians says that, that his glory is in the church. Uh, this is the hope of glory, Christ in you. You see, it's, it's, it's all about taking everyone who will receive him to glory with him. Amen. Are you all ready to go to glory? Amen. I, li I like it when you read somebody's, uh, you know, death announcement or obituary and, and it says they have gone to glory. Or they have gone to their eternal reward. I hate it when they just say, so-and-so passed away. I had an uncle, uh, not an uncle, but a cousin. His name was Willard, Willard King. And uh, one day I got a phone call and I wasn't home. So uh, it, was, it was when we had these uh, answering machines. So they left a message. And it was my youngest brother in Amarillo, Texas. And he, he called. And this was his message. Hey, people, Willard's dead. <laughs> Click. So I just turned to my wife and I said, Willard's dead. <laughs> we still laugh at him for that. You know, we, uh, whenever he pulls something like that, we always say, yeah, you remember Willard's dead. <laughs> I, know, I know for a fact Willard's dead. And, uh, but really, that's not the truth. When, when we die in Christ, when we pass away from this life, we pass on to glory. It's more appropriate to say Willard's in glory. Willard's gone to glory. Glory to God. Willard's gone to glory. Whoo! He finally made it. It was it was touch and go for a while, but he finally got there. Willard's in glory. I hope he is. Amen. But I, I'm I mean to tell you, we, the way we phrase things says a whole lot about how we think. Comes out a lot of times at funerals. Or memorial services. Somebody gets up and says, He was a great guy. He was this and he was that. He was this, and I'm really going to miss him. Well, I, you know, I, I, can just, I can just hear him in, in heaven. What do you mean, was? I'm more alive now than I ever was. And you think about it, I really loved him a lot. Oh, you don't love him anymore? You quit loving him? Is that how you live? When somebody passes on to glory, you quit loving them? Just listen to how people talk, and it kind of reveals where they are in their understanding. But I want you to know, when I, when I go on to glory, don't speak of me in the past tense. You can say things like, well, when he was with us, he did this and he did that. But now he's with Jesus and who knows what they're doing. Amen. He's up there with Willard. You know what I'm saying? And Willard ain't dead. Hallelujah. You know, don't, don't talk about me in the past tense because I'm not washed up. I'm not a has-been. It's not over. This life is over, but the, the eternal things have only begun. Amen. And I hope I can remember that when 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 you go to glory. So I won't talk about you like you're, you know, somehow or another you just are over. Because you're not over. It's not over. It'll never be over for you. Because in Jesus we have eternal life. And we have eternal life in glory. Amen. That's what he's saying here. Look in, look in John 17. I love this. Hallelujah. John, this is the prayer that Jesus prayed before going to the cross. This is really the Lord's prayer. That, that other prayer, that, that's not the Lord's prayer. That's our prayer. He said, this is how you pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? Our Father, he said, 
He said, pray, you pray like this. That's our prayer. That's not his prayer. It's our prayer. We call it the Lord's prayer because he gave it to us. But it's really our prayer. But but this this is the prayer he prayed. John 17, 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Amen. He did it for me and he did it for you. He came down from glory. He suffered. He returned to glory. And he's taken us to glory with him. Hallelujah. we got some glory days ahead of us, people. I believe in this life we share in His glory. And I believe we're going to see the glory of God fill all the earth as the water covers the sea. We're going to see it. I believe we're going to see it in our generation. You know, seven of you are in your 80s. And the rest of us are not far behind. But I believe we're going to see the glory of the Lord cover the earth in our lifetime. I really believe it. I really believe. I don't believe this generation will pass away till all these things are fulfilled. I believe it. And part of these things that are going to be fulfilled is the glory of the Lord covering the earth. What's it going to look like? I have no idea. But it'll probably look a whole lot like heaven because His glory fills heaven. What's it going to feel like? What, what's it going to take to make it happen? I don't think we're going to make it happen. I think that's something He's going to do. But I'm thankful that I can participate with Him uh, and be a part of it. Amen? All I have to do is believe the gospel and receive Jesus in everything He did, including... His resurrection. Amen? Don't leave Him in a casket. Don't leave Him in a tomb. Don't leave Him hanging on a cross. Follow Him all the way to the throne. Paul said He has raised us up and made us to sit together with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's your rightful place. And that's your rightful place this morning. Can you say amen? Amen? Well, let's have communion this morning. I, I don't see how we can start Passion Week without communion. And we'll definitely have communion next week. I don't see how you can celebrate the resurrection without communion. Doesn't make sense, does it? Amen? Are you ready this morning? You ready to enter into the glory of the Lord? That's your destiny. And it can begin now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God.